You know, the best part about the internet is how you can look at other people's bare, naked, unadulterated math exams. Somebody posted these two math exams to the calculus subreddit the other day, asking if they seemed like difficult exams for Calc 1, and I thought it'd be an interesting thing to take a look at these exams and see what you guys think. I'll zoom in here and let you take a look through all of the problems. You can also check out the original post linked in the description description, there is a lot of interesting arguing and discussing going on on the original thread. You can see question 6 here on exam 2, maybe you want to pause the video and give it a try. This is what we're going to spend the majority of our time today discussing, because, spoiler alert, question 6 is impossible. So most people had the opinion that these exams look, yeah, <coughs> <laughs> a little bit difficult for uh, Calculus 1. And uh, some people, though, were saying, eh, you know, seems doable, looks totally fine, looks totally normal. Some guy was saying, oh, yeah, you know, seems doable. And somebody replied to him and said, what about question six? And he said, yeah, seems doable. And the person said, okay, so how would you do it then? And uh, the guy started saying some completely nonsensical stuff. It didn't make any sense. It made them look like a total idiot. Uh, turns out they were just not on the same page as to which exam they were uh, discussing. But yeah, a lot of people thought anyone who said these exams seem like totally normal for Calculus 1, you're out of your mind. And my immediate take would roughly be, yeah, I agree. These do seem difficult for Calc 1. We're definitely missing, I mean, tons of context. So we could never say if these are too difficult for a couple of reasons, you know, we don't know the nature of the class exactly. Is it a college calculus class? I mean, we would assume so based on the name, Math 165, Fall 2008. Yeah, probably a college calculus class. Is it honors calculus? We don't know. Has the professor set a particular standard or expectation for how all of these questions should be answered, um, you know, because there's some questions that require write-ups and how much detail should they require. Uh, we just don't know this stuff. How long did students have for these exams? Are there more pages that aren't posted here? We don't know anything. But what we can say is take a look at some of these derivative problems. I mean, this, this is the part that just makes it seem totally unnecessarily cruel. In isolation, pretty much all of these problems look totally fine. I mean, some of these limits are a little gross. This one here has the cute trick where you're supposed to recognize that it's a difference quotient. So recognize that this is the limit definition of the derivative for e to the x squared, and that becomes an easy limit to evaluate. But you know, these are messy limits. Can you use L'Hopital's rule? Probably, I sure hope so. Um, you've got some chain rule stuff here that just seems a lot messier than necessary. Problem three here seems pretty standard. The rest of this is pretty normal. You know, a little bit more on the hard side. You wouldn't give these problems to your average uh, Calc 1 high school student. But, you know, it all seems like fair game as long as you've been teaching this material rigorously and uh, doing a good job making sure students are prepared for this type of conceptual question. Exam two, same idea. I, I think each individual question seems fine. Obviously, six, as we'll discuss, is not possible, so that's not so fine. Uh, but besides that, they're pretty standard. You got related rights type problems and derivatives, of course. But the derivatives just seem so unnecessarily horrific. I mean, look at these things. Having one or two of these, I can understand. But what is gained by having, what is this, five whole different derivatives that are this disgusting? This one here, letter E, you know, this becomes easier if you use logarithmic differentiation, which isn't typically covered in like an AP calc class. I don't know if college calculus classes would usually cover that. You know, this is exam two. So would they know logarithmic differentiation by this point? Perhaps. That certainly makes this easier. But even with logarithmic differentiation, this problem is just disgusting. It takes so long and you're really not doing any thinking at all when you solve this problem. And the point amounts really jump out to me here too. Like you've got 40 points of this whole exam is just for churning out these derivatives where, you know, it's easy to make a mistake. It's a big fat mess, 
but I mean, ultimately, you're not doing much mathematical thought here. It's just applying the rules, being careful, and, you know, maybe trying not to make your work look like an incomprehensible mess because you're probably going to run out of space as you try to write this stuff out. Anyways, let's get to question six here. We'll start by showing that it's impossible by providing a counterexample, and then we'll make a slight adjustment, you know, supposing what the problem maybe was supposed to be, throwing in an additional condition so that it is solvable and uh, go through the solution, which will involve Rawls' theorem, and I'll do my best to explain that for general audience. Even if you don't understand calculus stuff, you can understand the theorem at the crux of uh, this problem here. But let's read it as is. Let f of x and g of x be functions that are continuous on this closed interval from a to b and differentiable on the open interval. Suppose further that f of a is equal to f of b, so immediately we see that the endpoint values of the function are equal on this closed interval from a to b. And what else have we got? g of x is not equal to zero on that closed interval from a to b. We want to show there's a number c in the open interval such that this equation holds. So some number c satisfying this equation. So we're going to show there are two functions satisfying all of these conditions, uh, but such that there is no such value to satisfy this equation. Obviously that makes this a very bad problem, especially because, I mean, by the time you get to this problem, you're probably running out of time on the test. I mean, you're probably running out of time by the, the time you've finished problem E. I mean, my gosh, the time would be a big concern to me here. If I was, you know, if I had written this test, hopefully on a second look, I'd be like, oh crap, you know, I'm probably asking a little much here. I definitely want to cut this down um, depending on the time, the time constraint. All right, so for our functions that will satisfy the conditions, but not the conclusion, we're going to have f of x equals zero and g of x equals x. We could come up with some other examples or counterexamples, I should say, but this is a very nice simple example. We know that f of x and g of x are continuous and differentiable on all real numbers, so that's good. And also, remember, we need to suppose further that f of a is equal to f of b. So let's just pick an interval here. Let's say we're looking at this from 1 to 2. All right, so these functions are continuous and differentiable on this interval, and it is indeed the case that the endpoint values of our function f of x are equal. f of 1 is equal to f of 2. Of course, they're both equal to 0 because f is a constant function. And we see that g of x also satisfies this condition. g of x is not equal to 0. That's true on this interval because g of x is between 1 and 2 on this interval. All right, so we've satisfied all conditions here. I hope you'll agree. And certainly there is no point C. There's no C in this open interval from one to two that satisfies this equation. How do we know that? Well, because F of X is zero on this whole interval. So this expression on the left side of the equation is never even going to be defined. Forget about having a solution. So we've shown now that problem six is not possible because it's asking us to show that these conditions force this conclusion. But we've just shown that indeed there exists at least one pair of functions that will satisfy these conditions on at least one interval. And yet the conclusion is certainly not satisfied. This expression can't equal this one anywhere on the interval in question because this expression isn't even defined on the interval because the denominator is zero the entire time. Now, we're going to do a little bit of work trying to solve this problem. Let's pretend that we don't know it's impossible. We'll just try to solve it. And uh, we'll quickly run into a condition that we need in order to proceed further in the solution. At that point, I'll say what that condition is that we're gonna assume so that we can actually complete our solution. So let's just start with this key equation and see if we can get anything more from that. We have that f prime of c over f of c is equal to the same thing, but with g. If you don't know calculus and you're still watching, f prime of c is the derivative of f at the point c, which roughly speaking is the slope of the function at that point. g prime similarly is the derivative of g, at C, roughly speaking, it's the slope of the curve of the function's graph at that point where X equals C. All right, now we're going to multiply both sides by G of C, that's in the denominator over here, and we're gonna multiply both sides by F of C, and thus we're going to have F prime of C 
times g of c on the left, and on the right, we're going to have g prime of c times f of c. I think the kids call this cross multiplying what we've just done here. So that's the equation we have, and now we're going to subtract g prime of c times f of c from both sides. Of course, it's often useful to have something equal to zero, and if you know calculus, you quickly realize that if we do the subtraction, we're going to be flirting with the quotient rule, and oh boy, do I just love flirting with the quotient rule. So now we have f prime of c times g of c minus g prime of c times f of c is equal to zero, and those of you who know your derivative rules will recognize that this is the numerator of the derivative of f divided by g, remember, from the quotient rule. Now, thankfully, we know it is in our assumptions, if I could grab this exam, that g of x, we see, g of x, we know is non-zero. That means we could divide both sides of this equation by g of x because it's not zero. Thus, we could also divide both sides, of course, by g squared, and thus on the left, we would have precisely the derivative of f divided by g. So just writing that out roughly, on the left, we can divide by g squared, and on the right, we can divide by g squared because g is not equal to zero. More specifically, of course, we should be dividing by g squared evaluated at c. So then we recognize what's on the left as the derivative of f divided by g. This comes from the quotient rule. So this is actually just f divided by g prime evaluated at c. That's what we have on the left. That's equal to zero. On the left is the derivative of f divided by g evaluated at c. And so we have that derivative is equal to zero on the right. So here we realize that if we could guarantee there's a point c satisfying this equation, then we could work backwards from what we just did to show the equation that we want is true. Remember, the idea is that this equation would really be the final product. We just started with it and worked with it to see what we could learn. We ended up here. So if we could show there's a point C satisfying this equation, we'd be able to work backwards to show that the desired equation has to be true. Now, when we start thinking about guaranteeing a point exists where a derivative is equal to zero, that is what would make us think about Rawls theorem. Rawls theorem is a special case of a very famous theorem called the mean value theorem. Usually students will learn about Rawls theorem first, and here's what it says. Rawls theorem says that if f is a function that satisfies these three conditions, it's continuous on the closed interval from a to b, it's differentiable on the open interval from a to b, and its endpoints are equal, so f of a is equal to f of b, then there has to be some point in the interior of that interval from a to b such that the derivative is equal to zero. There has to be. Now, our idea is that this function, f divided by g, is playing the role of the function in Rawls theorem, the function where we want to show there's some point where its derivative is equal to zero. Now, the problem is that based on the conditions given to us in the original problem on the exam, we cannot satisfy the conditions of Rawls theorem. We do have one guaranteed, thinking about our function f over g, because we were told that f and g are continuous, so f divided by g is also continuous, since g is not equal to zero. We're also guaranteed that. So we're good on condition one. In fact, we're also good on condition two. We know that this function is differentiable on the entire interval, because f and g are differentiable on the entire interval, and g is not equal to zero. So we're good on conditions one and two, but there are two problem still. For starters, three, we do not know that this is the case. We know that our function f, note that this f and this f are, are different f's, it's just a, a clash of notation here, it's called overlapping notation, but f we know starts and ends at the same place. f of a is equal to f of b, the exam question told us that. However, we don't know that g of a is equal to g of b, so we don't know that this quotient f over g of a is the same as f over g of b. We know that f behaves that way, but we don't know that g does, so we don't know if this quotient does. We need to have this condition to use Rawls theorem, and right now we just don't have it. 
Furthermore, even if we did have condition three and we were guaranteed this number C in the open interval so that our derivative is equal to zero, which means we would have this equation, we couldn't necessarily get back here because of the division by F of C. We don't know if F is non-zero. The problem told us that G is non-zero somewhere here. It told us that G is non-zero. I can't find it. There it is. Uh, but we don't know that F is non-zero, so we wouldn't even be able to get back here if we had this equation. But of course, that then tells us the two additional conditions that we need to solve the problem. I'll write it down here. What two conditions should we have been given? Well, we should have also been given the condition that G of A is equal to G of B. So G starts and stops at the same place. With this, we know that f over g has the same behavior. So if we know that g of a equals g of b, well then certainly f over g, this quotient function evaluated at a, has to equal f over g evaluated at b because f and g are both the same at a and b. So their quotients are as well. I'll just put a little arrow here saying that we needed this condition and it would imply this, which is what we would really use. Uh, and then also we would need the condition that f is non-zero. We would need that f of x is not equal to zero for all x in the interval. So for all x in that closed interval from a to b. In fact, we could even get by with this being an open interval, but either way, we need to know that f is non-zero on that interval. Closed or open, either way, it doesn't matter. But if we had all of that, then indeed we could apply Rawls' theorem. By the way, the idea behind Rawls' theorem for the uninitiated is really intuitive. It's like, you know, super simple, obvious theorem if you sketch it out. It just makes perfect sense. Remember, part of the hypothesis of the theorem was that a function starts and stops at the same uh, y coordinate f of a equals f of b so let's say that that's this y coordinate this height that i am drawing a dotted line at this is the y coordinate f of a and f of b so if i have this function f that starts at the same place here where we'll say that x is equal to a and it ends at the same place we'll say when x is equal to B. Well, if it's a nicely behaved continuous function, then maybe it looks something like this. And yes, of course, there has to be at least some place in here where the function's derivative is equal to zero. Because either the function is constant to start and end at the same place, in which case it's just a straight line and has a derivative of zero everywhere, or it moves around. But if it moves around, at some point it needs to turn around in order to get back to where it started. It needs to turn around to get back to where it started. Where it turns around, we have what's called a horizontal tangent line where the slope is zero. That could be our point C where F prime of C is zero. Of course, in this sketch, there happen to be two places where the function turns around and we get that slope of zero. So yeah, that's Rawls theorem, very cool. And like I said, with these additional conditions in the problem that G of A is equal to G of B and F of X is non-zero, we can use this wonderful theorem to prove the result. All the conditions in the problem tell us that the derivative of F divided by G exists. And then by applying Rawls' theorem, we would have a point C in the interval so that the derivative of f divided by g is equal to zero at that point C. And then, of course, using the quotient rule, we know the derivative of f divided by g at a point C is equal to this beautiful expression here. We could then multiply both sides by g squared to get rid of this denominator. And of course, we just have zero on the right. And then we could add g prime of c times f of c to both sides to get us here. And then because of our new condition that f of x is non-zero, we could divide both sides of this equation by f of c and show that this equation has to be true as desired. So hey, that's pretty fun. If you have other exams you'd like me to take a look at, please do share. I mean, we could talk more about this, but I feel like uh, most of these problems are less interesting than six. You know, it's always fun to find a error and discuss that. And Rawls' theorem is fun too. These are very trite derivative problems. I kind of want to go on eBay and see if I can find some old examples exams and stuff. I, I really got a kick out of that sort of thing. This is this is a little bit less interesting because I just printed it out from the internet, you know, but it was from fall 2008. It's, you know, it's like an antique here, this exam that, that we're discussing. Why somebody posted such an old exam and asked about it? Again, who knows? A lot of context we're missing. I mean, it could just be a typo. Whatever. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos 
on the internet.